Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Songwriter Select podcast, where a group of songwriters will be talking about music, songwriting, production and whatever else we fancy this evening. I am your host James Nighthawk and with we, with yeah, and with me in fact, we have uh, three fellow writers. First up, Becky Thomas, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hello there, Becky. Do we have Paul Boyd? Hello. And Anthony Lane. Hello. A full house. Fantastic. Right, last week we, well not last week, last episode, we had quite a meaty podcast. So this one we're aiming to be a little bit more laid back, a little bit more, a little bit more whimsical for you. We have a uh, feature discussion all about quirkiness coming for you later on. So there's a preview for you. But we're going to go straight into our now listening. So I've got my script here. Let's start with Paul. What have you been listening to recently, Paul? Uh, I've just come back from holiday from Port Aventura in Spain and uh, spent a lot of the time at the mini disco with the kids. And every night they did a sort of party. It was very Sesame Street themed around there. And they right. played a Sesame Street <laughs> they played a Sesame Street theme song most nights, but it was the most funkiest, upbeat thing that I'd never heard before, never heard this version of it. And spent they had Wi Fi there, so I was looking for it on YouTube and iTunes just couldn't find it anywhere. Asked around, they didn't know what it was. Got back, I must have listened to about 300 different versions of Sesame Street themes. <laughs> and eventually, I don't know why I didn't think of this before, thought, oh, download Shazam and give that a go. It found it straight away, and it was actually by the Tokyo Scar Paradise Orchestra, of all people. I like their name. I will be Yeah, there. so uh, found it on YouTube, but it was a live recording that was very messy, and it wasn't what I'd heard, So, but knew the artist, so searched it. Apparently it was on one CD in the 90s, only released in Japan. So uh, it was uh, about four hours searching to find it, but eventually found it somewhere uh, and got a hold of it. So that's what I've been listening to. And it's amazing. Okay, first question. Have you gone insane, Paul? A little bit. <laughs> Sunstroke. I'm slightly worried for your mental health at this point. Um, you've listened to the Sesame Street. How many, how many times online to find this? <laughs> Just snippets of all the different versions, like the player snippet of it. And it wasn't that one, wasn't? No, not that one. Oh, it could be this one. No, not that one. Could be this one. Did you know Stevie Wonder did a mix? I found that one. So basically, you're telling us that you're still drunk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. it, it was all inclusive. <laughs> Don't drink so did, the, did the Tokyo Scar Paradise Orchestra, do they beat uh, Stevie Wonder in um, the funk stakes? Hands down. <laughs> got it. Look it up on YouTube, but it's a bit messy because uh, it's a live recording. But the studio recording I managed to find is exactly what I heard. And it's amazing. <laughs> okay. There you go, so boys and girls. Don't drink and podcast. Um. So that <laughs> Spanish kids party songs. Oh, of course. Oh, no. are, are the classics still there from our childhood, or oh, are they, have they no. gone? Well, they did Head, Shoulders, Knees and Toes, and... Oh, fantastic. Um, Hokey Cokey, but Veo Veo, if you look that up, it's amazing. Chichiwa, my new favourite. Uh, look that up. Is there an equi equivalent of the, was it the Ketchup song or something that was a few years ago from... Except this, yeah, last, this... Last Ketchup, I can't remember what it was, you know the one I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, these are, um, it was either Spanish pop songs, so El Tuberon, which is Shark with some moves, is really good. This, I mean, it's some great stuff. Um, but the Chichuá had the kids doing stuff, and they ended up walking around like zombies. It's hilarious. <laughs> so that's worth looking up on YouTube as well. <laughs> well Are we going to hear the influences coming through in your music? <laughs> well, my, my next Latin children's Spanish song. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out for it. Well, we know you love a strong melody, Paul, and um, the, the strongest are in the kids' songs. So they really were. Well, we did promise you a more whimsical podcast, <laughs> boys and girls. So we started off with a plum there. <laughs> uh, anything else to add there, Paul? Did you call or... me? What's that? Sorry. Did you call me? <laughs> a plum, you ass. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the sunburn coming through. I'm afraid. Um, Right, shall we move on? Um, Becky, what have you been listening to? Um, well, mine's far cooler than uh, than Boydie's. <laughs> um, mine's all about Sir Tom Jones, who I saw playing at um, a, a festival recently, uh, just a small family festival um, called Llama Tree, and I thought he was absolutely brilliant. Um, but he's not exactly kind of up there in the cool stakes, so just as kind of holiday mode as, as Boydie's almost. 
Um, but really, really good. Like his, um, obviously, his big thing is his big voice, and it is huge and amazing. Um, and his uh, band that he was playing with are all brilliant, and the real rock and roll feel for, of it all came through fantastically um, in the set. Everyone's dancing. Uh, he did a cover of um, Tower of Song by Leonard Cohen, which um, I was aware of, but didn't know the song very well. Um, and I've listened to Leonard Cohen's version since, and I really don't like it at all. But uh, Tom Jones's version was just brilliant. And I've also since listened to his um, uh, studio version of it. He recorded it as a um, released it as a single in 2012. Um, and that's really nice. Not ro as rock and rolly as it was on stage, but really, really good still. So, yeah, that was my listening for this this week, really. I haven't done much else. That says, um, I've heard that many times about Leonard Cohen, that many people enjoy his work, but often when performed by someone else. Yeah. So he's I'm one, one of those people. There yeah. we go. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know too much about his work um, as far as his recordings go, so I can't comment on that, but it seems to be a theme that goes on there. A similar that some people that can't get on with Dylan's voice say the same about his work when it's recorded by other artists. I was just going to say, Cohen should be locked in a room with Bob Dylan, basically. <laughs> and they should write songs and hand them out. And yes, <laughs> through a letterbox and not be allowed out. Yeah. Well, I like Dylan, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to agree with you there. <laughs> um, Becky, um, his set, was were there lots of uh, classic uh, Tom Jones songs or was he trying to um, go more hip for the kids? No, it was all the classics it was all the party tunes because um, he had a big audience to get dancing and it really worked so he was doing um, It's Not Unusual um, Delilah uh, Kiss, Sex Bomb uh, Thunderball all of those all does, brilliant. Does anyone <laughs> remember, Remember, uh, it must be the best part of a decade ago, where he did a, an album of collaborations with some yeah, uh, yeah. I do, with yeah. some pretty hip artists at the time. I really enjoyed the one he did with uh, Karis Matthews of Catatonia. Yeah, that was the Cold best one, outside, definitely. Uh, was that that one? Uh, yeah. I, yes, that was, yeah. Mainly because I really like Karis' voice, so anytime she's working with anyone, I quite enjoy it there. Um, yeah, but there was that time where he was doing, that was, is that where Sex Bomb came from as well? that era i think it was i think it is yeah same album i think brilliant great stuff okay um yeah, so if you get a chance to see him live brilliant really brilliant <laughs> i know he's not cool but he's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> well i'll jump in here because i have been listening to someone who is considered cool um someone some a band that is considered cool i've been listening to uh the 1975 uh does anyone else in this podcast know this band at all uh, a little I've heard the name. You've heard the name? Yeah, Becky? heard of, but not much at all, no. Well, this is unusual for me because I'm listening to something the kids are into. So this <laughs> is, well, not, not the kids as in Paul, your kids, um, the hip kids. <laughs> um, this, was, this was an artist I, uh, I got into when I was looking for more music at the end of, end of last year to fill the iPod for the gym. Something with a beat, something with a groove. And these were recommended to me. And yeah, I mean, I haven't got a huge amount to say about them except for it's very good, slick indie pop rock music with um, some very strong 80s influences it seems in many many respects I'm listening to it and I'm thinking that some, some of this could be undiscovered 80s tunes that have just been slicked up for uh, modern times uh, they broke um, through BBC introducing a few years ago they did the classic thing of releasing a, a bunch of EPs and then putting most, most of that material together as an album which is their self-titled or obviously the 1975 and yeah, I don't have a huge amount to say about it, except for if you like your indie synth pop rock, it's a really slick, well put together version of that. I think they're a Mancunian band. Uh, I haven't got my Wikipedia working here in front of me, so don't quote me on that. Yeah, no, Manchester. Okay, brilliant. I remember that correctly. And yeah, and they, looking at Twitter, they seem to have a lot of followers and a lot of young followers that seem to have bands like One Direction and uh, Catfish and the Bottleman and a lot of kind of hip, cool bands <laughs> that are in common, if you see what I mean. But yeah, it's just it was, I try and find these bands that are, that are still coming through to stay to stay relevant, to stay current. And this one, I was very pleasantly surprised by. I really quite like it. Um, lots of lots of eighties reference in the production and uh, the lyrics of lots of uh, lots of. Uh, kind of can-do attitude, lots of sex references, because that makes them cool, obviously. And, yeah, 
I quite like it, basically. Can, can I ask you something? Even Definitely. though they're really cool, I'm taking it they're not all 40. No, they're not, no. they're not born in 19... So they're using the name as some kind of I iconic... D- I did read of... why, but I can't remember Retro where thing. the name come from. I'll have to get back to you on that. But no, I think they're far too, far too cool to be... Yeah, they probably think... Far too cool to be 40? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's from a poetry much. book. <laughs> it was something they found scribbled in a poetry book. Oh, there oh, we right. go. That, that's, that's really disappointing. I was really hopeful that they were all a bit more older than me. <laughs> well, they've got that thing of having all their artwork just being uh, black and white pictures of things rather than themselves. I don't, want, I don't know what any of them look like because I haven't Google imaged them. Uh, <laughs> their artwork is just uh, a neon sign with the 1975. So uh, they could have been anything. Maybe that was the trick, but well, I, I checked out it. Girls, one of their tracks on YouTube, and yep. it's quite interesting. They were um, trying to be really cool. We're not pop. We're not pop, and it seemed like they're trying really trying hard to not be pop, and then ended up being really pop. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it'd be quite, interesting to see if they develop. I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, you you'd actually quite like them, Paul, because they're big cor- yeah. big choruses, um, big choruses, big melodies, uh, very slick production. And what was I going to say? Um, yeah, um, they. I think they were championed by Zane Lowe at one point. He he helped break them through. So again, uh, a commander of hipster there going for them. So I'm hearing one track. I did want to get the album. So oh, you did? I'm okay. Them. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Yeah, I'd listened to more. The one that everyone, the one that there was their breakthrough was Chocolate. That was the big track okay. that everyone loved. So maybe check that one out next before you dive in. Okay. Right, last but not least, Anthony, what have you been listening to? Um, I kind of ran out of things to listen to that I knew I liked, so I did what I don't normally do, and I asked Spotify to recommend some stuff to me. And after wading through a pretty thick puddle of poo, um, (laughs) I found found this guy called Tobias Gesso Jr. um, and his album Goon. I don't really know anything about him. I looked him up on Wikipedia. He's a Canadian songwriter. Uh, His record's been produced by himself and a handful of people, the most notable of whom uh, is part of the Black Keys, I think. Um, But he's a really good songwriter, and he plays the piano, which I really like. Uh, And his kind of production style is very stripped back. It reminds me almost uh, a little bit of carol king or the beatles or even some kind of older r&b motowny records it's hard to describe but uh you should definitely check him out would you say organic when you've mentioned all of that yeah i would um i think the production's very sympathetic to the song so you hear uh, a personality and a songwriter as well as a song, it's something I really like. Um, and it's nice and varied. There's a lot of good melodic material, but he doesn't tread water. So there's kind of a lot to take in. It's the kind of album you can listen to several times uh, and not get fed up easily. Fantastic. Nice, a nice uh, off the um, off left field find for you there. Yeah. Do you know where he's from? Canada. I already said that. You should be still? listening. <laughs> He's still from Canada. I missed that. I do apologise. I was checking something on the old script here. That's cool. all right. Definitely one to check, though. Brilliant. Um, any? I'm guessing no one else has heard of this chap. No. Nope. I looked him up when uh, Toe okay. mentioned it. Yeah. Very, um, like you say, stripped back, man and piano. Yeah, quite enjoyed it. Good <laughs> stuff. I look forward to trying it. Great stuff, guys. So let's move on. Anthony, take the microphone and let's hear what's going on in the world of music news this this last few weeks. Okie dokie. Um, bit of a slow week for news, it has to be said, but I've managed to dig out some uh, some little gems for you. Uh, first one is uh, his royal purpleness, Prince, um, <laughs> is releasing his new album exclusively on the controversial Tidal platform. Uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is a kind of boutique streaming platform that's headed up by Jay-Z and a bunch of other big music biz uh, hotshots, the premise of which being that it pays better <clears throat> than the other streaming services like Spotify, um, but it kind of ties artists into more exclusive deals. So 
hence Prince exclusively releasing on this platform. Um, my only concern is that not a lot of people are going to hear it because I don't know anyone who's subscribed to Tidal. Anthony, was it Tidal that we spoke of a couple of episodes ago? They were struggling for subscriptions, or have yes. I misremembered that? Okay. That's exactly it, yeah. So we have the figures as well saying that they aren't doing particular... They're not doing it gangbusters. It's taken off the way they anticipated. I'm pretty sure of that. Well, recently Apple Music has also entered the market and they still haven't... I mean, obviously, they've been going for a matter of weeks rather than years, but Spotify is still destroying them in the in the ranks. And actually, the week that Apple Music was launched with the new iOS, um, Spotify became the top, um, top app that week, which obviously wasn't <laughs> what Apple wanted to happen. So there could be a because it was in people's the forefront of people's minds, maybe that triggered people to rekindle their Spotify um, love, which wasn't, which wasn't what Apple wanted. Interestingly, I noticed that Prince recently took his Warner Brothers stuff down from Spotify because uh, I'd been listening to it. So I don't know if that's got anything to do with this deal, but it almost makes me wonder, does he care more about getting a higher rate of royalties than he does about people hearing what he's done? He's claiming... He's fighting for the sort of cutting out the record labels. Uh, okay. So that's his sort of crusade. He's he's back to calling record labels um, the, the whole slavery, telling new artists not to sign with labels. Mm-hmm. Um, he's back on that crusade. So obviously Tidal, it's just him, the artist, signing with Tidal okay. rather than him signing with a label that then signs with Spotify or somebody. The thing that really annoys me, I mean, I really love Prince, okay, I'm a, I'm a massive fan he can kind of do no wrong, with this one exception of his crusading, because I get that if you're Prince, having a record label isn't necessarily the best thing, right, because they take a load of money, and they take a load of control, and he's a control freak and he knows what he's doing, but for a new artist having a record label can make the difference between people hearing what you've done and not so I, I kind of think he should shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the knows what he's doing in his, his inverted commas because he took all his stuff off Spotify and the streaming services. Then I think some have reappeared. I think he released his new single, which people are assuming are from the new album, but no one knows what he's going to do. So mm. a single's been released, I think, on Spotify. <laughs> right. The album's coming out on Tidal. Mental. It's just... It, Oh, he does what he likes, which is hilarious. <laughs> it's a little bit messy by the sounds of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with your points, both of you, that uh, we uh, no one needs a record label to release on Spotify. I know that firsthand. But if you want to be big and you want to get millions of streams, you need backing, you need someone pushing you. And when you're, when you're Prince and you have a history, you don't need that because you've already built that. But when you're new, maybe he's talking from the wrong end of the industry, perhaps. But what has confused a lot, he did a big Paisley Park press thing with the journalists on Saturday and got all the journalists to Paisley Park and I think spent three hours playing music and then did like a 10 minute interview at the end. But the whole thing out of that is that he's working with Jay-Z. So is there a collaboration with Jay-Z or is it Tidal and Jay-Z? And no one seems to know. (laughs) There was journalists there and no one thought to ask. (laughs) It's just, oh. Oh, that's brilliant fantastically eccentric messy and yeah all of that fun stuff <laughs> we'll keep our we'll keep our eyes peeled on that one uh, what's next anthony that's funny you should mention eccentric and messy because this is a brilliant story right keith richards we all know yeah who he is and if you're young and you don't he's that ugly one from the rolling stones um, uh, which, which ugly one from the rolling stones the one that plays guitar <laughs> really well um anyway so he's been caught on record saying that the iconic famous Beatles record Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band was a mishmash of rubbish um okay he's entitled to that opinion but what really bothers me are the Rolling Stones that great that they have kind of earned the um I don't know earned the status to say that kind of thing about arguably you know one of the best albums ever created I kind of just want to blow a raspberry into my microphone here, but I don't know how good my pop shield is. Um, <laughs> that's just stupid. Um, Sergeant Peppers is an iconic album. It's hugely beloved. What does he benefit by saying this? Well, other than getting his name in the papers, which, okay, he's done, 
I think his main complaint is that he likes this rock and roll, you know, basic kind of R and B style. And the okay. Beatles, you know, went and did everything. Okay, well, let's go back to the the pivotal question. Uh, my my mum always tells me that when you were when they were growing up, it was always you were a Beatles or a Stones person, and you kind of had to choose your camp in that regard. Uh, in the same way that when it went through to the, the it was T Rex or was it T Rex and Slade were they the two that up against one another? There's always been the era of the two big rock bands, Oasis and Blur. Oasis and Blur would be another one there. Um, I'm not even going to try to guess what it is today, um, but maybe. I mean, the Stones and the Beatles, as you say, Anthony, they had two different aesthetics. The Beatles were throw everything in. Let's get as many mixtures as we can and write hundreds of songs. And the Stones were far more, we want bluesy, um, grassroots, uh, darker rock and roll sounds. So they are two different bands there, but they both have huge followings and they're both beloved. There's no need to, 50 years later, throw Stones, surely. I agree. I mean... I, that whole kind of tribal thing, I I kind of think so, aren't they a, a bit too old for that? You know, well, we music is music. People love it. And they've both kind of made their mark on history. So having a pop kind of seems a bit childish. Yeah, to be fair to Keith, though, um, in that same interview, he does say that it lost the roots and he loved the Beatles when the Beatles were the Beatles, in his words, when it had the roots when they started and he thinks they just got carried away but recognises some thinks it's a genius album but he thinks it's a mismatch of rubbish <laughs> one of the things I love about the Beatles is that in seven years they had this sh- they, they changed annually they went from a covers band to the mop tops to uh, s- slightly slightly arty times and then into the hippiedom and then into the s- singer songwriters and then hating each other and still working in the studio it was all in seven years nowadays in seven years that's two albums yeah um and they what they've left to songwriting is basically as we've spoken before in our podcast is a an ode to songwriting a beginner's a beginner's guide to how to write songs if you just learn their catalog voila there you go that's how you write songs I wouldn't say the same about the Stones there because there's a lot of stuff which is far more, from a songwriting perspective, far more basic. and A and mishmash of rubbish, if you will. Well, I feel the same I feel the same about the Leonard Cohen that we spoke about earlier. I love the Rolling Stones songs. Absolutely love the songs. Just not them playing them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love hearing bands play them, but I, just, I think they're the best at them. Well, I mean, I, I will admit to a bias that I love the Beatles and I have a few Stones albums. Ex- Exile on Main Street I have and I really enjoy. But then I don't often get to the end of it because it's it's a long album and there's a lot of guitar solos and that isn't that isn't my bag. So whereas the Beatles, you don't get time to get bored of a song. So next one started before before the first one's barely getting going. So, um, yeah, I mean, let's not have this conversation because this is a whole podcast unto itself. But it sounds a bit silly is what my, my general response there. <laughs> Um, okay, moving on. <clears throat> Next up, uh, Dr. Dre, uh, who's the famous producer, uh, people like Eminem, that kind of thing, big hip hop royalty. Um, he's made a new album, and interestingly, he's decided to donate the uh, royalties from it to fund a new performing arts centre in Compton, which is where he's from. And I gather that's a pretty run down, nasty ass kind of place. Um, that's not that's not on the sign, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they, they might wear it with pride, you don't know. What I think is really interesting is someone who's made his name from a kind, a form of music um, that kind of it, it seems very obsessed with the individual and kind of wealth and status and glamour. And, you know, his role, especially in a kind of... He, he was quite involved with quite a lot of gangster sort of rap to begin with, um, is doing something like this. It, it kind of lets you peek behind the curtain a little bit i find that really interesting these are people even though what they're saying sounds ridiculous to us white boys in the south of england you're back into a gangster rap what do you think Becky? <laughs> am i <laughs> you, you and your homies you love it surely <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> I think it's interesting the story comes immediately um, on the same week we're talking about Jay-Z and his Tidal platform because that is the the classic hip-hop makes make some paper. Um, it's talking about a venture that makes money. And mm. then this is the opposite. This is um, giving the money away. 
it could just be the case of Dre has a lot of money already and this is a charitable move for him. Let's be fair about this. He's probably not struggling for pennies. I don't think he is. No. Um, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about, about the world of hip hop. I, I mean, one of my favorite hip hop albums is M- Missy Elliott uh, Under Construction, which was, I think, early noughties album. And one of the reasons I love that album is uh, that came after a few deaths in the industry of um, TLC uh, and uh, T- Lisa Left Eye and uh, Aaliyah passing away. And she wrote yeah. an album. They, they were both friends of Missy Elliott. And it, the point being that with this album, she wrote an album and she wanted to write an album about what hip hop was about when hip hop started. And hip hop was about busting rhymes and beats and having fun and dancing and busting grooves and all this kind of stuff that then got pushed to the wayside when gangster rap appeared and it became about making paper. Uh, and I don't know if that's the history of rap. I don't think it's always been in rap music. I think that was a period and I think maybe Dre and that kind of mid 90s period of uh, rap and hip hop took that to heart. So I think maybe that's what you're you're mean you're coming from there Anthony. Yeah, yeah, I, definitely. And it isn't intertwined. I mean hip hop when it when it really originally started was about breaking the rule book of what recorded music could be and how samples could be used and how they could cut and paste and it was really grabbing these new technologies in the 80s. Um and using them for making kind of cool music and then the attitude came later so maybe we're just passing that period of hip hop and that could be a good thing what i do find interesting though is you know dr dre now he's sort of matured and can do this kind of thing i think ice cube his appearances in you know 21 jump street and 22 jump street which is brilliant they've got a, a sort of comedy and sense of humor about them uh, I watched Pitch Perfect 2 today and Snoop in that was just hilarious. Um, he is so yeah. fun. But they've got this sort of almost like self-deprecating a bit maturity about them. I can't quite see Kanye doing the same thing. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I think you have to go one one of two ways, don't you? You have to realise that you're having fun with yourself or you just keep believing your own shit, basically. It's going to go one one of two ways and <laughs> we all know which way Kanye's going there. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, point made basically there, Anthony. Um, good on him for giving yeah. some stuff to charity. Imagine what it's going to be like to be one of the guys that rolls up to that performing arts centre to make a bit of music and finding Dr. Dre there. Professor Dre. Professor, <laughs> Professor Dre. Professor <laughs> Dre. Well, he is already the doctor, so... I love it. And, and our last story, Anthony. Last one, right, this is really quick. Um somebody's decided to take uh, Warner Chapel to court if you don't know who they are they're one of the world's leading largest publishing houses in the world uh, who currently make something along, along the lines of two million dollars or is it pounds dollars a year from the song Happy Birthday which uh, has been under their copyright for you know ever practically anyway so the plaintiff has decided that they've found some manuscript of this song but the copyright notice hasn't been printed, which in legalese uh, translates to the song's no longer in copyright. So they could be uh, about to lose out on a good couple of cool million a year. So we're talking a paperwork slip. We are. We're talking a someone forgot to typeset the copyright notice and now everything's gone to hell. <laughs> uh, okay. Can this be retroactively reply, uh, applied? Can people get their money back if they've paid... <laughs> That I don't know, but that would be very interesting. That I think a- the article that we read was talking about a class action amongst uh, um, people who had paid and want their money back. So, yeah, that's what they're after. Hmm. Odd one. <laughs> yeah, director Jennifer Nelson is the one that's looking to get her money back for mm. using it. Interestingly, $1,500 to use it in a film. But we don't I- see it often. <laughs> is that all? <laughs> Yeah, fifteen hundred. I thought it was five thousand. That uh, Father Lucid claimed the song should not be under copyright after being told they would have to pay one thousand five hundred to use it in their film. Ah. <laughs> that seems incredibly low, considering that film budgets tend to be made in the millions. That it is a yeah. short song, to be fair. <laughs> and it might and not it, be a it, massive film. And it does it does repeat a little bit as well. It does quite repetitive. <laughs> To be, to be fair, if I've written Happy Birthday, I wouldn't be complaining about that. So, so they're making uh, $2, million, $2 million a year from it, so it's been used a lot then. 
Uh, well, a, f- a fun story to end there, and we'll have to see what happens going backwards. Uh, well, if, if any, anything does come of retroactive claims on that one there. Cool, um, that wraps up the news. So, moving across to Anthony, um, not Anthony, from Anthony to Paul, we're going to move to our regular feature, Anatomy of a Song. Um, Paul, would you like to take it away? Okay, yeah, we're going to look at Sugar, which is the second single from Maroon 5's latest album. Um, we're looking at, again, one, two, three, four, five, six songwriters on this one. So another team. Okay. Uh, is Adam is Adam one of them? He is. Okay. He is. is the rest of the band the other uh, five songwriters, or are we talking sort of producers and professional? Uh, yeah, writers? Dr. Luke's in there again. So yeah, we've got producers in there as well. Okay. Um, it's uh, one twenty BPM, so an absolute disco. I read that as just being too lazy to change the default settings. <laughs> yeah. oh, recording oh, software. Oh, you, you made my you made my muso joke there, Anthony. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, you're so much quicker than me. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, carry sure. on. <laughs> Eight second intro. Uh, obviously, the song uh, very hooky. Interestingly, I I couldn't make out the. I heard it on the radio quite a lot and didn't know it was called sugar because when that word comes in the chorus, I can't understand it. And I didn't no, I know. I can't either. It's almost like a filler word, but it's the title, and obviously the theme of the songs around that. But yeah, it was just a bit odd. It could have been any word, really. Uh, I think I can bring in a bit of uh, muso geekery there. Um, when I was uh, studying uh, distortion at university, something we got into was vowel distortion, and uh, in in the world of opera, um, people say they don't understand opera because it's in Italian. A lot of Italians can't understand opera because um, it's so heavy on its vowel movements and its movement and its held <laughs> vibratos on its vowels that even if you do speak Italian, you can't pick the words out. Now, perhaps because he's quite heavily in his falsetto in this song, uh, combined with the layering of the of the of the production, it just gets a bit swallowed. Would you agree with that, Paul? From what yeah. you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't. I've been listening on headphones, so I didn't get the radio first. So, and having the title in front of me kind of helps me know what I'm listening to. But I see what you mean. So, it's, sorry. It's, def- it's definitely the falsetto, I think, that makes that um, not understandable. But it all, despite that, even though you don't know it's the title, um, I think it still makes a really quite effective earworm. That's the thing that would just be repeating round and round in your head afterwards. I think it's very whistleable. Because of the falsetto. Yeah, yeah whistleable, yeah. <laughs> like a, a, the pitch that a dog would hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have got in my notes here that I've given him all credit for his falsetto on this because <laughs> it's, it's, it's bloody good. Um, um, oh, I, I don't like it. Oh, okay. Well, I don't. The, sorry, it's falsetto. I, I, you don't like it? Okay. No, across all of his, just his voice in that particular way. Well, um, it goes through me a bit. When... When we were emailing ahead of this episode, um, you suggested this song, Paul, and I, my reply was simply, as long, yeah. as, as long as it isn't as bad as Payphone, I don't mind. Um, because in that track, which is a very catchy pop song, very well written in that regard, I can't stand the note he, the way he hits the notes and the way it's been processed by the producer, that it's so perfectly robotic and edited on that bend upwards on Payphone it makes my shoulders go a bit funny every time I hear it. To be honest, that's probably why I feel like that because I didn't have the problem with the songs prior to that. Right. So it might be that that's sort of done it for you. Yeah, I mean, this one, any vocal editing has been a lot more cautiously used. I mean, it probably has been corrected and tidied up. It sounds really edited to me. Is it's, that... But I, not compared to Payphone, it doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know I, that song. I, I went, no, well, I, I'd, I'd avoid it if you're... Uh, averse to such things is it like share it's it's not you no know, well the thing is i can deal with the share one because that's very apparently used as an effect with the payphone one it's more of a uh people don't notice it and i'm sitting here cringing at it because it's yeah. it's also the pitch as you say paul it's the pitch that it's at it's yeah. quite it's quite grating up there but i actually in this song I quite like his voice, and I'm actually quite impressed with the falsetto. I think it's quite tidy, and uh, it kind of suits the songs. So it's got that funk, uh, it's got that funk poppy uh, disco vibe going on. Well, not, not disco, but you know what I mean. That, um, 
a slightly cheesy but with, with restrained pop vibe about it and I think the vocal works pretty well but it's always going to be a Marmite vocal with him um, talking of which Becky um, do you want to jump in and give your points here that I'm reading in front of me <laughs> <laughs> I think I was in a bad mood, but <laughs> feel free to be grumpy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just um, I've never liked Maroon Five. I've never liked Adam Levine. I find him really just so full of himself. Um, and the video, oh, it just <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> okay, what do you really think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on the video. I, I think it's a, a, an abomination. Uh, oh, I haven't you know, seen this visually. video. I, I'm, I'm intrigued now. I might have to disappear for five it. minutes. Oh, I like the video. <laughs> oh, it's really horrible. And it's full of people shouting and screaming. And so I'm just trying to listen to the song. Do you mind shutting up, please? Um, but I know what you mean about the falsetto. I, I can't say that I like or dislike it. I think it really works for the song. It sounds tuned to me, which was a bit annoying. Um, it's definitely layered. I mean, there's definitely layering and, and uh, clever trickery yeah. going on. But I don't know if it's a huge amount of tuning. If it is, it's done well because it's not done in the way that's uh, che- cheating. Yeah, humanity. I know he can sing well. It and just, yeah, it sounds quite processed. And to just me. to jump in here, I mean, Becky, you say you've never liked Maroon Five. I really liked the first. Their, I don't feel it's their first song. It was definitely a breakthrough song. We're talking a decade ago with this love. Yeah, that was great. Um, that is an amazing pop song. And when that yeah. came along, it's like this is. Funky guitars. This is a uh, stop-start piano lines. This is a great drum groove, and this is a band with a sound and an attitude. And when I heard that, it's like this is a great song, and I still go back to that song uh, now. And I just don't think they've ever topped it. Um, I think moves like Jagger was a brilliant pop song as well, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one, Paul. Um, as our as our pop aficionado, there, I think that when I first heard moves like moves like Jagger, I didn't know it was Maroon Five at all. It, I thought it it could have been any slick new pop outfit, and I thought that was a great great vehicle for them. But um, uh, yeah, so I, I do like certain Maroon Five stuff. I've I've never I've never gone out of my way to get an album, or I wouldn't go and see a live or anything. But I think they're good radio fare, and they they do very well for what they do. Um, the main point I had about this song is that. Oh, my notes here. Uh, I like it, but there's nothing that really drags you in. It's it's amazing that it's doing so well because I think they've written stronger choruses and I think it's just a very neat, very good pop song. But I don't think it's outstanding even for their own standards. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I quite like the songwriting part of it. Um, just interestingly, because we always do, title appears twenty times uh, in the song. And most interestingly, the chorus takes up 55% of the total song, which over, is... Over half more the song than, is the chorus. Over, over half the song is the chorus. Um, it's quite a long chorus, though, and it's not as repetitive as some you hear out yeah, there. Yeah, true. true. It's kind of like it got a, a little mini uh, chorus bridge in, in, in the middle of it, which well, I in, quite like. Which brings me nicely on to the next point, is uh, there are those that are saying that um, middle part of the chorus is a lift from Michael Jackson's oh, beat. So blatant. Did you get it? Oh yeah. yeah. And the, even the rhymes fall in the same place. Oh, I've uh, got to go back and check this one. Yeah, I'll check that one out. Yeah, oh, I'm section. surprised you didn't pick up on it. Yeah, I'm, I didn't not, I'm not a huge MJ list, uh, fan, so. Um. Well, neither am I. But I mean, that's a really famous song. But it's the bit in um, uh, "Show Me Good Love" in "Make It All Right." Need a little sweetness in my life from the. Obviously, sugar, and then it's the uh, beat it part, showing how funky strong is your fight. Oh, it doesn't yes. matter, strong or right. <laughs> Just so, beat interestingly, it. the show's in the same place. Obviously, the syllables and it, the melody, it does sound like it, uh, and similar rhymes, which I found quite interesting. I mean, I, I'm I'm doing this from memory here. I think the the chord sequence behind it is is different. Um, Probably. So that <laughs> baseline definitely is. Yeah, well, yeah, that. But the melody is the copyrightable part mm. and the lyric. And that melody is identical, maybe bar a note or a half note here or there. Oh. Well, we might we might be hearing that in future episodes of the podcast in the news <laughs> yeah, section. <laughs> Maroon <laughs> 5 going bankrupt, night. yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're running out of melodies, boys and girls, I'm afraid. Um, there is, there is nothing left. We're gonna have to hard drive. Uh, we have to wipe everyone's hard drives and start again in pop music. 
Um, I, I was going to say about about this, anticipating our next conversation, that um, I think with this song and probably with Maroon 5 generally, although I don't listen to enough to say this with conviction, but um, I think it's it, it, lack, it lacks the quirks that make, would make it interesting for me. It's just really slick pop that uh, the lyrics aren't interesting really. Um the performance isn't interesting. The production isn't interesting. It's slick, but it's not interesting to me. I mean, so absence of quirks. <laughs> I mean, the big change from this love, uh, Maroon Five, to moves like Jagger onwards is that it went from being a a funk pop band to a producer's band. To me, it's like the producer suddenly took charge and everything I've heard since moves like Jagger, I very much enjoyed the production and what they're doing in the studio. But if you took that away, you wouldn't have the strong melodies and the, the strong songwriting behind it that I think maybe they started off with in the early days. Um, again, I say that not knowing their catalogue too well. So if I am entirely wrong there, please do write in and tell us. I really want to go and revisit their first album actually after this and kind of do a comparison with that. And it's their really stuff. good. I remember having that album when it came out and there's a, re- a handful of really strong songs on it. Well, then the question is, are they being smart? Are they working to a market uh, and targeting, because obviously it's working, uh, as opposed to uh, sticking with what maybe their creative uh, input was to start with? I don't know. My, my hunch is that the first album was full of really good songs that appealed to people like me, and the music they're doing now is a really different kind of good song that appeals to people 20 years younger than me. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the record company has had some kind of uh, say in how this band progresses in terms of being more commercially viable. Because even though that first album did well and they had some good singles on it, I don't remember any of the follow-ups being widely listened to. Uh, I didn't certainly didn't hear about Maroon 5 properly again until Move Like Jagger. And that's what seven mm. years later we are t- we are obviously a little bit apart from it because we're in the uk and i know they have a much stronger following stakes yeah that's true so uh but again music as the emails we get from hit songs deconstructed show a lot of the kind of process electronic and urban styles do very well in america so having that having that edge on the production probably does do quite well for them there whereas maybe that doesn't quite tally to our market i don't know um, or to for grumpy songwriters on the podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah, the songwriting technique jumped out for me though. Just um, to cover, it's a standard form uh, A B A B C B, albeit with some sort of structures within those structures. But there was a good variation of long held out syllables and then nice little runs with lots of syllables to break up the sections. I thought, from a writing point of view, that's definitely something to latch onto. I thought it had a strong middle eight as well. Yeah, it breaks it up nicely. Yeah, don't often hear a pop song with a kind of such a uh, different middle eight to the rest of the song these days. Yeah, uh, there's definitely bits I'd like to about it. I, I very much enjoyed my listen throughs. It was primarily that I didn't think it was as earwormy as maybe a pop song that's doing this well should be. Yeah. Although, is that a blessing in disguise with some pop music nowadays? Cool. Anything else to add before we move on, Paul? Uh, no. Cool. Good choice of song there. Thank you for that. Right. Um. I think we'll take a quick break before we get into our feature discussion. So for those on listening as a podcast, you'll we'll be back in a few seconds. Um. See you in a moment. And we are back. So this is our our featured discussion. It is time to talk about quirkiness. Um. This is something we've been talking about um amongst ourselves for a couple of weeks now. Um, We're talking about quirks in music and being a quirky artist or writing quirky songs. Um, Basically, we want to talk about whether quirks are a good thing, whether they're a bad thing, whether they make or break artists, um, and how they affect how an artist puts music together and their fan base. So, um, firstly, let's go for the obvious. What do we mean by quirky? I'm going to move across to Anthony here, because I think you've actually, in your notes here, made a really good... Uh, synonym for us here when we talk about quirkiness, Anthony. Have I? You have. Um, would I like to help? Do you want some help with that? Or <laughs> um, I'm just I'm just looking at it really I'm quickly. Just re- reading my own notes. Um, okay. It's, yeah. 
yeah okay i would say that this is less a definition and more my interpretation but for me uh a quirky artist is generally one who has a strong personality um that finds its way into their songs uh, as well as their performances so uh, you know they're the kind of artists that you can't easily separate their work uh, from their performance of it as opposed to for example the song that we were just talking about which i think would hold its own with a lot of different people performing it so uh, the one that everyone's thinking of and that we've talked about is bjork um i think it'd be very difficult for anyone to convincingly recreate a bjork song without sounding like a bit of a spanner to be honest um <laughs> or bjork <laughs> <laughs> or bjork um yeah so so to me it's it's just another word for a strong personality um that's my personal take on it i wouldn't i wouldn't say that's a, a definition as such no but i like it i like that because it it gives us a kind of grounding to how to think about quirkiness the way i think about quirkiness in an artist is similar to what you're saying in that w- if you consider your work as a pop star who releases the song you hear it on the radio and then it just washes over you that to me is the that is um an anathema to quirkiness that is Anyone could have written this, anyone could have sung this, and it doesn't hit me. Whereas when you hear someone like Bjork, or you hear someone like Paloma Faith, um, who's another one that I've got written down here, or Alanis Morissette, or Tori Amos, and for some reason I've just run on female artists there, because that's where my brain went. Um, and again, maybe David Bowie would be a good one for the male artists there. Um, or Daft Punk with their the way they produce using their vocoders up front. You can almost tell who it is if you missed the announcement of the new single, and halfway through, you can go, oh, this must be the new song by Daft Punk. Listen to that. Um, would we agree with that, guys? Is that not, not originality? Well, is quirkiness tied in with originality is a good question. Because uh, in order to be original, you have to do something which is away from the norm. So that by itself is slightly quirky, perhaps? Yeah, I, I agree. I, th- I, th- I think it's... Um, it, personality is part of it, but um, it doesn't necessarily require, you know, um, an individual's own personality. It could be something very consciously done to uh, make themselves unique from whatever else is going on around them at the time, so they stand out, um, which might not have anything to do with their own personality. I would yeah. argue that it does. I would say that if you're consciously shaping an identity, okay, it may not be how you talk or behave you know when you're not in the recording studio or on stage but i think that the fact that you chose to present yourself in that way still says something about you as a personality albeit a contrived one for those purposes yeah i suppose you could have spent a lot of time analyzing and seeing where the kind of the gap in the market is or you could be just thinking well this is this is something that to me is fun and different and whatever and i'm going to go along with it so yeah totally uh, that's a, a great segue there because we've got a question here about can quirkiness be faked or fabricated? Uh, now, a great example for me, I saw a Tumblr uh, post a few months ago, which was a, a repost, so it was, it was an old one. Um, we've all, we all know Lady Gaga, obviously, um, who's done very well for herself, although not so much in the last, last album, it seems. Uh, do we all know Roshan Murphy from uh, Maloko? Does that mean anything yeah. to yes. Cool. Mm. Uh, yeah, Maloko. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was basically one of these picture feeds where it shows the two artists next to each other. And it was just a case of here's Roshan Murphy in 2005 and here's Lady Gaga in 2006 wearing the same <laughs> dress, just with a slightly different angle on it. And it was just one of those things where I looked at it and, and smiled because I'm a big I'm a big Roshan Murphy fan. And sh- to me, that could be an example of quirkiness that is slightly leaned upon as opposed to what is more natural. Um, Roshan Murphy, to me, is kind of crazy. Um, she's written jazz albums, she's done dance albums, she's done pop albums. Her most recent one is very difficult to listen to on the first listen. It's very uh, experimental and electro. And she's a bit off the wall. She's a bit crazy. Uh, whereas with Lady Gaga, I've always had that slight feeling that is this craziness put on? Um, does anyone else get that? And this is also relevant to obviously we're not talk, we're not a celebrity podcast here. We're talking about the music. Even in the music, it feels sometimes that this that there's oddities going on for the sake of the market that she's selling to. I don't find her music particularly quirky. I have to say, I think yeah, she, her I appearance agree. is quirky. 
and maybe you know kind of her routine a performance but the songs could quite easily be handed out to you know half a dozen other female singers and stand up just as well and not suffer by not being associated with her I mean, she gets a good pass because she's a, a writer herself, and she's a, she's a, a quite an established writer before she even started releasing her own material. So she she has a lot of respect for that, and to give her her dues, she she is a big part of the production as well. But I agree with you. With her, it's more of a an air of quirkiness and an air of uh, over the top personality, which just kind of goes around with her, as opposed to what comes out of the speakers. Uh, so we, I mean, what I really want to focus on today is quirkiness in the actual song and how that makes a person stand out and whether or not that's a good thing um so let's go let's go to one we've already mentioned which is such an obvious touchstone but a really good one is is bjork or bjork i never know quite which way to say it with those umlauts there um uh i mean i i actually wrote a paper on on bjork at university and it was about her forays into electronic experimentalism I think it was around about the time when she was doing the album of just uh, vocal sounds. I think that was Medulla. Um, Anthony, do you want to correct me on that if I've got that wrong? That sounds right. I, I find it hard to remember the names of her albums. Especially because sometimes so it's hard to pronounce, yes. Yeah, um, yeah and she's, she's gone further and further into the experimental edge. And her music can be quite tricky to listen to if you're not really sitting and concentrating. Uh, Paul, you've written here that um, her example of you say that you're not a big fan of her quote unquote far out stuff but when she does the poppy stuff with a quirky edge you're you're on board obviously the classic being her cover of it's so so quiet yeah so i mean are you a fan of that song yeah absolutely so that that to me is the sort of from where i'm coming from with music um the commercial side and the pop stuff the whole the holy grail everyone's chasing is it needs to be different but not too different and that's where, you know, the Bjork far out stuff, whoa, but oh so quiet, that was a sort of different, but still a bit poppy and structured. Uh, I thought that worked really well and gave her some commercial success, but does she want commercial success or not? Probably not, because she went back to the other stuff. So it's No, that that was always yeah. a side project for her. Um, she did that because she had some, I mean, she's classically trained and she has a background where she did do some music of that vein. Um, and I think that was kind of her little cheeky ode to her uh, theatre days. And she she sings it amazingly, and that performance is just stunning. But it isn't representative of her catalogue. Um, I've got in my notes here that it's her it's her creep. Um, in the same way yeah. that Tom York probably despises the fact that on Spotify the top two v- songs played by Radiohead are Creep and Creep Acoustic. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was very lucky to see Radiohead at an Oxford gig uh, when they hadn't played Creep for about three albums and they literally went on stage, said, screw this, grabbed a guitar, uh, he, he, and Greenwood gra- grabbed his Telecaster, did the classic chajunks, everyone screamed and they went into it. But yeah, they kind of hate that song because it becomes <laughs> the song people know them for and it is like that with, B- with Björk. That isn't, if that's all you know of her, that isn't her music. And <laughs> you might be pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised if you delve into her catalogue. But it's, I like your point here, Paul, that with your commercial hat on, that it's about being different, but not too different. The word quirk itself, to me, makes me think of something which is slightly odd, as opposed yeah. to batshit crazy. <laughs> would, we, <laughs> would we agree with that? Quirky, if you, if you called a person quirky, you'd still be friends with them. If you call someone a bit mental, you might step back. I'd say. be best friends with them. You, so. Anthony would be BFFs with them. Yeah, um, yeah. He, he is down with the lingo there. Um, <laughs> but that's what you're saying, Paul, isn't it? You want to be, you want to stand out without being so odd that no one wants to stand next to you. Yeah, well, it's interesting. The first thing that sprang to mind, but we were thinking of quirks. I went right back to sort of the Buddy Holly catching the voice type quirk. It was just something a little bit different. I saw that as the quirkiness rather than the far out stuff yeah because i mean i can almost say that any big artist you could define as quirky because if there's something which makes them them especially if they've got a voice which stands out if you've got a voice which you can hear and go oh this must be and um, for me it was paloma faith um, last year when i heard um can't rely on you come on the radio i'd miss the announcer or it just kind of came on and 
after one verse, it's like, this is the new Flow in My Face song. I really enjoy it. No one had to tell me that. It's just you hear her voice and that's her singing. I don't find her quirky. I don't oh, find okay. her quirky. It's I, just, I, I she's her... got a recognisable voice, yeah, but I don't yeah. think there's anything else stand out really okay. about her. So that to me is her quirk, her voice. Her voice has got that very I recognisable call it a quirk. thing. Okay. Mm, no, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> I would just say it's got a, a recognisable timbre. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, so, so um, Becky, give me some of your, your favourite quirky artists. Um, well, the one that I had in mind probably doesn't really fit the definition that we've just been talking about, but I, I had in mind Nick Cave. I think we're still searching for the definition. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about Nick Cave um, and uh, doing a bit of background research. Um, his kind of um, moniker is the Prince of Darkness, so I suppose that is his quirk. Uh, but he he's obviously quite... Um, gothic and morbid in his writing he uses profanity a lot um his the way he styles himself um in the way he dresses and his cl- his hair and so on uh is all not like you would expect a um a kind of a, a rock uh front man to be but I love it personally <laughs> it's, it's different from what you'd expect to me um he uses his voice in an interesting way to me. He, he talks, he um, sings very deep and um, does a lot of talky singing. Uh, and his musical style is all over the place, really. <laughs> uh, so, um, but also, uh, despite that, I think you always recognise that it's it's Nick Cave that's that's behind it all. So, yeah, um, could, is it a fair assessment to say that the reason you? Th- he stands out for you is that he has a number of things which combined make him him as as opposed to my example with Paloma Faith which was a recognisable voice and then you guys say that's pretty much all she has there I think so but it's but it's it's what makes him him but it's also what makes him different from everybody else right yeah um okay I mean to go back to Paul's point here and try and tie this in uh, you mentioned about being different but not too different. Uh, I'm quite a big fan of reading um, pop psychology books. I'm no psychologist, but I find kind of psychology and anthropology absolutely fascinating and always very useful as a songwriter to study humans and how they think because um, it helps you helps you put the lyrics together. And I can't remember which book it was. I think it might have been Psychology of Interpersonal Behaviour. And they talked about how people like to get into cliques and how people... A certain personality types like to stand out and they like to be different. And it's the whole, it's the classic thing of, I don't want to wear a uniform. I don't want a school kid. I, want to, I don't want to wear this uniform. And then they come out of school and they'll put on their goth, quote unquote, uniform or their <laughs> Adidas clothes and go play football with their mates down the park or they'll put on their punk clothes. So you don't want to wear a uniform. Then you kind of do. You just want to wear the uniform that you choose and you want to be you don't want to be so different as to be the guy that no one talks to in the corner, but you want to be different enough that you have your own clique and your own group that you can kind of get along with. And it's interesting you talk about Nick Cave there, because obviously he has a slightly gothic uh, way of singing and performing and the way he looks. So he, he is different, but it still kind of goes along with that classic, uh, slightly gothic styling that is in that niche of personality would you agree with that becky uh i yeah i would i've no idea of his own motivations behind having the styling that he does uh but but yeah i mean that makes sense I mean, um, I mean, but then pop music was, ju- like a group that uh, um springs up around something was it there before or did it come after i don't know <laughs> well Pop music has always, and it'd be really interesting to hear um, Paul and Nancy jump in on this, pop music has always been intertwined with um, kind of, uh, I forget, forget the phrasing for this, you might have to help me out here, guys. Um, pop culture? Yeah, pop. It's, yeah, subcultures, that's the word. Um, it, pop music has always helped define people into their subcultures, and the music people listen to um, often helps people define themselves, and it helps them find friend groups and people that think and act alike. So quirks often then will kind of help signpost you into that. Um, if you're wearing if you're wearing black makeup and uh, 
and, and black clothing that's kind of signifying that you're into this the, the quote-unquote darker stuff if you're happier being over the top disco pop and doing the lady gaga thing that's saying i'm I, i'm a pop princess and this is this is what you're going to get here come along if you're into this stuff so when does quirkiness stop being signposting for just genres and by extension of that, um, subcultures, and when does it actually become completely unique to the artist? See, I don't think. It, sorry, Paul. Hang on. Do do continue, Obi. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, make the point that the artist we've referenced so far um, does being quirky generate a, a longer, more sort of faithful fan base. So Bjork has its own fan base, and I don't know Kate Bush and David Bowie and you know Lady Gaga would have their sort of maybe more um faithful and fanatical groups which yeah. sort of their longer they have longer stay than some yes. of the pop acts that come and disappear um because you know, we've t- talked about prince already but you know people know prince from purple rain but when he went quirky with the symbol and everything lots of people yeah. are you know not not into prince anymore but that's what i really got into it so it was quite fanatical that way although to me he's always been super quirky because everything he does is kind of imbued with this crazy purple stuff. But people that aren't fans would just know him from a film that exactly. wasn't that far out, that wouldn't know, just heard of the other stuff. But uh, yeah, so I was just saying, do they, does the quirkiness might not be popular to the masses, but generates a strong fan base for the longevity of the artist? I'd agree I think, with that, yeah. I think we're skirting around the idea of quirkiness being uh, something that kind of defies genre or something that kind of sits in it for example yeah, you that, that's, that. my, that's very much my question there anthony when does when does being quirky start being unique as opposed to just playing into the hands yeah. of those to whom you're aiming for i think the true kind of what i call true quirky sort of artists are the ones that are kind of intertribal for want of a better word you know all these kind of we're talking about goths and pop and electro and edm you know all these kind of tribal movements that people like to belong to this gang um the artists that kind of either straddle those genres or kind of carve out their own one i'm talking about people like tom waits or yep. rufus wainwright or bjork you know yep Radi- um, i'd put radiohead in there as well because they jump jump between these yeah, things very easily radiohead. and i mean when they came out of kid a after um okay computer the fans were up in arms about it um and it was a case of well, we want to do an electro album screw you yeah so that is literally what you're saying there it's a case of no we don't we're not going to appease our market we're going to make the art we want to make and I think it's that mindset that creates something that we call quirky. It's someone saying, I've got something to say. I kind of want to talk about these things, uh, you know, to touch on these subjects when I'm saying it. I, I want to use these sounds and I don't care who likes it. It's that kind of mindset that creates that highly individual music with a strong personality, in my opinion. Is there a mild edge of arrogance that is needed to... Um, really pull off quirky from what you're saying oh, there, Anthony. Not sure arrogance, I think bloody mindedness. Okay, which is a, a, a nice hazy line between the two there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an important but hazy line. <laughs> Your pop psychology there, James. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, all great points here. And I think it's just, I mean, I wanted to have this discussion primarily because I wanted to kind of get the feel for how people view quirky artists and how... I mean, I bring this back to you, Paul, here as our as our pop head, because um, initially when I, I said this, I was thinking, oh, P- Paul's going to hate quirky artists. He's going to want to be, he's going to want something to appeal to the masses in order to get the big sales. Actually, I think I probably, I probably not doing you justice there because you you probably think that you actually do need to stand out a bit, um, but but not too much. So I think <laughs> okay. more 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 like what you said, really. You know, what's the perfect amount of quirkiness then for, for <laughs> like commercial success? Well, 12, it's just that, 12. Li- yeah, <laughs> 42. <laughs> it's just that little thing that makes it different. I think we're going back to, you know, all about that bass. There was just that little, um, you know, the retro feel, but had a quirky feel, but still the pop production values, uh, the Taylor Swift, the hella good hair, you know, just little things that stand out i think in the commercial market because the labels the music placement the sync deals they're looking for what's on the radio but something a little bit different but no one can define that different 
we're talking about a pizza with a quirky kind of seasoning yeah. rather than like you know some kind of bizarre sushi yeah <laughs> okay if if you were ordering pizza and sushi turned up that would be more than quirky <laughs> yeah. but if it was a pizza and it just happened to have calamari, calamari on it that would be a quirky pizza indeed yes he's hungry solved <laughs> I, I, I've eaten so I'm fine I can keep talking with this metaphor here um <laughs> Yeah, okay, but that, yeah, so that's just kind of left of field. That's making you stand out. Um, that's yeah, the like, shared that's, example that's a, we that's spoke a pop, about. That's a pop quirk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that classic example of bringing auto tune um, to the masses. And have, have, I, have you guys heard about that story? Um, how that all came to be? I've heard the record. You've heard the record. That was enough for me. So oh, well, um, I'll, I'll give you the summation <laughs> of that. The, rec- the, uh, the producers that put that record together. They obviously um, got hold of Autotune uh, well ahead of um, the mass market producers. They whacked it up to full, just messing around, and they really liked it. And when they put it out, um, I think there was an interview in, it was either Sound on Sound or something equivalent, a producer's magazine. And they tried to skirt around what they'd use because they didn't want anyone to know that they just grabbed <laughs> the auto tuner and turned it to 100%. Because that's basically what you're hearing there. Um, it's the vocal corrected into a step stage, so it doesn't do the. The portmento between is it portmento um, between the between the uh, the bending to the notes it just steps which is why it sounds like a robot. Uh, they wanted to claim it was a, a program vocoder or something along those lines, and they tried to keep that secret for some time. And then once that secret was out, we started hearing it everywhere. So, <laughs> and now and, it's on that confused dot com advert with a little robot. Yes, it's on robots everywhere. If if you play video games, it's used uh, in something like Portal as the voiceover anything that makes you sound like a robot basically um so from the pop side yeah quirky is just being slightly slightly odd slightly different but not too different are we then suggesting that in the more arty singer songwriter world that quirky has to be something a bit more substantial to stand out anthony what do you think i am suggesting that yeah i'm suggesting that if you want to properly kind of carve out your your space in the world of songwriting um, as a singer songwriter, as opposed to, you know, writing for someone else, then yeah, having something uh, different, new, be it, you know, what you're writing about, the way you deliver it, instrumentation, combination of all those things, um, I think is key to kind of. Well, what we're saying, what you're saying there in some respects is just make sure your personality comes into your music and then maybe your quirkiness will come through. It doesn't have to be your personality, not the one that you kind of, you know, walk the dog with necessarily. I'm talking about, you know, a maybe it's a contrived thing. It's to me, it's a kind of artistic intent. It's almost a statement. You have you have something musical that you want to do and you have ideas about it that you that you want to get in there to kind of give it its own space, its own little frequency you know on the wavelength becky as our as our youngest quote unquote writer you've been writing for, <laughs> you've been as, as in your writing ages you are younger than perhaps <laughs> the three of us here do you find that as you're putting your music together you're consciously thinking about this being a a becky thomas song or have you not got to that stage or would you not want to use that yet uh i'm not no and um, i have been told once or twice that perhaps i should be so finding uh, your stamp. Yeah, yeah, finding the thing that glues it all together as a one persona and one style. Uh but I haven't given that a lot of thought so far. So and I'm I'm kind of happy to just go along with okay, this is my idea at right at this moment in time and this is what I want to do with it. And whether it matches up to what I've done before, I don't care. I'm sort of happy with that, but equally I would I would like to be able to develop into something that is a recognizable um kind of uh, trait that um, runs through everything. So I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure where I'm going with that. <laughs> um, Paul, um, as someone who writes very much aiming to get your songs out to um, publishers for artists to pick up, when you're putting these songs together, say you're not working to a pitch because that's something by itself. If you're working just in general, do you have to think about a potential quirk that an artist might have or do you have to write blank do you have to write avoiding that and then let the artist put their stamp onto it later no you have to put 
all the quirks, the hooks. It's hooks, but by definition, hook being something different that people latch on to. Uh, arguably, hook and quirk could be the same thing often, uh, often are. Um, that would all have to be in it. Right. So, and so, if you look on YouTube, you can actually see some demos of stuff people have written for artists like Beyonce and Rihanna, and all the little quirks, everything were done by the writer. They weren't put on uh, by the artist after. I'm sure artists do, but for a song to get picked up, oh, here's a song being pitched for so and so. Oh, yeah, it does that thing she does. They've right. got to be in there. Okay, so we don't. You don't write a blanker slate and then expect Beyonce to put her ghetto fabulous on top of it no you, that needs you, to be on it you paul have on the to demo. make sure that ghetto fabulous is already there absolutely which of course it would be is that um, the name of your third album james <laughs> don't give it away <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen how i spelt fabulous though that's 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 my quirk um, <laughs> um you've lost my train of thought here you get um right let's talk about non-quirky artists for a minute um the reason I thought about that is um, looking at your notes here, you, Becky. You've mentioned uh, Nick Cave, and mm-hmm. you've got you've mentioned uh, where the wild where the wild roses grow, which was the Kylie duet. Yes, it was. Yeah. Now that made me think about Kylie Minogue, and if anything, <laughs> she's. I mean, I'm everything quite... makes me think about Kylie Minogue. <laughs> Paul, <laughs> keep it clean. This is a family <laughs> podcast. Um. Now, I quite like Kylie Minogue because she's one. She's kind of she's kind of lovable. She's she's harmless. She's a good little singer. She's a pop starler, and she's always been loved by the British public um, far more than Australia perhaps loves her. Um, but she's always kind of she's changed a lot over the years, and that Nick Cave um, duet was during her indie phase uh, when she was on I think it was Deconstruction Records, and she's always seemed to me like quite a blank slate artist um, where you can hear the writer and then Kylie's on top of it, um, so to speak. Uh, with <laughs> I wrote myself into a corner there, didn't I? Um, so with the, Nick, with the Nick Cave, she did the dark ballad and it worked really well. And then she did a duet with the Manic Street Preachers and it, mm-hmm. was, it was indie rock and she did that really well. Uh, but then when she came back and she came exploded with Can't, Can't Get You Out of My Head, which, Paul, I'm sure you've dissected that song to pieces, being the pop um, epic that it is kathy dennis I kathy think. dennis yes very much yeah. her, her must must be her her biggest earner by by some shot because i mean that went to number one in dozens of countries i mean when your chorus is la 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 you are in business basically <laughs> it's, it's a genius pop Being song by the smurfs by the way <laughs> <laughs> i can just think of the smurfs doing the dance routine now. i think it's oh, there's, there's a, a pop video waiting to happen um but with with kylie she's kind of the writer's dream because she doesn't have too much of a personality to the way she, she sings but it still comes across as a Kylie record but she's come she's done so many different things Paul do you think that's a good or a bad thing for an artist like her or is she an exception in that regard? No, for her I think that's a, a good thing and dare I say it that's the whole schooling she had through the Stock Aitken and Waterman days where they were just plucked out of soaps um, I think it's unusual that she's had the longevity. Well, she's she's fantastically malleable in that regard. Yeah. And maybe, in a, again, we don't want to start talking about celebrities. We're a music podcast. But if you take a, a more, more modern con- contemporary, if you talk someone like Britney Spears, who was supposed to be, again, that kind of pop starlet, maybe she just kind of went off the rails and didn't get the longevity because of personal or just ways of dealing with fame. Um, so maybe it's just she's a she's a trooper in that regard. Yeah. Complete I don't pro. know. I think I think Britney will come back at some point. She'll she'll be like our generation's share. <laughs> and what will be her auto tuning? Because she's already done that. I have um, no idea. <laughs> but I can't see her going away, even though she's sort of become slightly grotesque. Uh, possibly. Well, although I I would actually say that Kylie Minogue is grotesque to me as well. So <laughs> maybe That's I'm rather unkind. <laughs> I'm talking musically. Paul, I'm, I, Paul, I'm, not judge- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not judging her as a, as a person. I just find her musical output is kind of it, it's criminally bland to me. Well, I mean, um, she hasn't. The last few years, she hasn't been doing too well. Her last couple of albums have just been very much fans only because they haven't stood out. They haven't been the big singles. There have there hasn't been. I can't get you out of my head since that track, basically. 
Um, but maybe that's saying something about as an artist because you say that she's did she, you say criminally bland was that what you said I did say yes. that yeah. well, quite, it, well, uh, just, I wanted to just <laughs> check that before I end up putting my, put my own foot in, foot in my mouth um, so there we go if maybe she was a more quirky pop star and had, had something that put her stamp on it rather than just treading water with the pop songs maybe you'd be more intrigued with that re- um, regardless of the fact that it isn't a genre that you care about Anthony which obviously we're all quite aware of here Quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Very diplomatic, James. I do try. I have to. I have to co- hold this rabble together in some regards. <laughs> um, brilliant. Um, does anyone have any big points to add, or are we kind of getting towards the end of this here? I was just going to make a quick point about um, one of the other, or a couple of the other artists that I'd mentioned in my notes were um, Liam Gallagher and um oasis and jarvis cocker and pulp and actually in between the two of those um blur and i think there's a kind of a sliding scale there of of quirkiness um which seems to be exactly opposite to their scale of commercial success (laughs) if anyone's following me on that idea (laughs) it's a it's also a sliding scale of art schooliness yeah yeah um i'm assuming you're putting pulp at one end Blur yeah. in the middle, and then Oasis yeah. at the yeah. at the lager rock end of the scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Anthony, you were listening to was it the new Damon Albarn or the new Blur or both? I was listening to the more the new Damon Albarn. Yeah. Yes, you put me onto that, and I've been very much enjoying that album. By the way, it's been, yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it? been um, circulating on my on my headphones quite a lot. It's a great um, great evening listen. Very chilled, and love the production on that album. But yeah, he's he has he's found his own little quirk as a writer there. By doing something a little bit oddball, but e- but Blur have always been slightly quirky as far as a uh, an indie band go. Um, Don't forget, Gorillas was. Yeah, I was just about to say, yeah. Yep, Gorillas was a very quirky um, arrangement going with the uh, uh, urban producers there, and that did quite well for them at, at one point there. So he's clearly got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. So Becky, are you saying the antithesis of that is Liam Gallagher, who does sixties, seventies rock songs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just uh, to put some words in your mouth there for you. <laughs> not not to say that Oasis were bland, but um but definitely not weird in any way or particularly off the wall or you know any of those things. I think they were quite sort of straightforward pop rock. Pub rock. Pub rock. Pub rock, pop rock. <laughs> Oasis, yeah. I mean that was my 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 school era was oasis and blur and oasis were the football players uh drinking down the pub and blur was were the the quirky kids drinking cider down the park um <laughs> you don't look old enough to be an oasis and blur school person james oh thank you anthony <laughs> and a picture he uses from about 20 years ago love <laughs> <laughs> it that picture That's would be funny because i i was at school when the whole oasis blur thing kicked off and I don't remember Oasis being big with the kind of sports crowd at all. No, I, I saw Oasis. The trendies, there. I think. Yeah, they were definitely the trendier as opposed to the arty, arty yeah. option. <laughs> no, I, I, had I, the I saw experience a, of that. I had um, Oasis. I saw Oasis at Wembley Stadium. Could you get any more football hooligan-y than that? Really? <laughs> Hang on, you're talking about kind of uh, the third album in for Oasis and the fifth I album think, for Blair, aren't you? Oh, I've, I've lost the chart here. <laughs> Um, 95 was Don't Look Back in Oh, was, um, What's the Story wasn't it was that 95 yeah. and Park Life 95 yeah yeah so I think I saw them 98, 99 yeah so, okay yeah. the difference the di- those few years made a lot of difference let me just tell you that <laughs> yeah well Be Here Now was the most returned album of all time there's a little pop fact for you there is that right yep and also the most broken album of all time as, as a producer does anyone still own that CD at all Never did. I never had it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd say check Spotify, but they may have... I returned run. it. They, they, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'll get very geeky for a whole 20 seconds here. It was during the, the phase of the 16-bit loudness wars where producers mm-hmm. were going louder and louder, pushing their compressors and limiters onto their output bus. The problem being that if you do that to a 16-bit file, you clip it, and that file, that album, combined with the fact that they mixed it on certain... Um, illicit substances, which <laughs> which basically kill your low frequency, um, uh, what's the word? Um, your ability to hear low frequencies, your perception of low frequencies. That's the word. 
meant that the album is tinny and uh, clipped pretty much from track one onwards. So if you've got a good pair of headphones, enjoy that. Um, so th- that's what happened at that point, Anthony. They started taking over the production duties and it changed them as a band entirely. Okay, that oh, figures. That figures? It got so, horrible around there. It got horrible. <laughs> yeah, there's a li- little production story for you there, guys. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, that's a nice balance that you're talking about, Becky, with the, that run of, run of artists there. Um, interestingly, I'd say that the quirkier records there stand the test of time better. I st- I still enjoy the Blur back catalogue. I don't find myself going to listen to much of the Oasis stuff. Would anyone else like to chime I'd, in on that yeah. idea? Yeah, and Pulp. I think the Pulp. Yeah. Different again. I think that stands out. You hear those. That 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 their seminal album, Different Class, was that what it was called? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I listened to that recently, and it's a great album. It stands out as a very unique album, a quirky album, and it's still thoroughly enjoyable. I can see that being the type of thing you'd like, Anthony. I did like it back in 97 or whenever it was. Um, It's not the kind of record I would go back to. Okay. Okay. I've developed a bit of an allergy to Britpop, to be honest. Um, (laughs) It was a a troubled time in my life. (laughs) Too many suspended fourths, too many, by far. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's your muso joke, guys, for the week. Um. I think Oasis is really the only thing I can go back to and properly enjoy oh. uh, that kind of falls into that camp. And I think it's because, uh, without sounding too snobby, it's it's the most musical out of those bands. You know, I think Damon Albarn's a good writer and he's not afraid to explore his musical ability and play with it, whereas like Pulp and Oasis were a bit too straight down the line for my taste and yeah Cocker's an interesting singer and his lyrics are still entertaining but musically I just I find that a bit pub as well to be honest okay <laughs> well I've only got the one album so I don't have a huge swathe to pick from there um well that was great guys I kind of had a feeling that this conversation was going to lead us down a whole bunch of different just general avenues to talk about some artists but after last week's um chord uh, calamity um of uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> steady on sir steady on it was a lot last week and we did extremely well and we're going to move on now to Becky to get some feedback from last week um, because obviously uh, we set up two threads on the songwriter forum um, after last week's podcast both of which were very active so Becky do you want to give us some feedback yeah absolutely um, B- Boydie's fantastic thread all about the chord theory and so on uh, was well received so that was brilliant um, and where, thanks where, back again to Boydie for that where can people find that Becky? on uh, Tone <laughs> songwriterforum.co.uk plug plug, uh, plug. <laughs> uh, that, Boydie I have to say congratulations that's the most epic thread yeah. we've ever had and yeah brilliantly put together well done mate the four metums of a nightmare but... Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, and we just wanted to thank people listening to for sticking with us through all that um, quite heavy going stuff, and and then sticking with the the thread as well, and feeding back into it, and a few people talking about how they use chords, um, and going back to the basics of of writing down the chords that fit the the key that they're working in. So that was interesting to see, and it's it's a universal thing that works for a lot of people. I think. So yeah, that's good. That feedback was it was really good to see that people were following it through, and as you say, Becky, that there was a fee- feedback directly. This is what I do. Oh, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one. And oh, I haven't thought about doing it that way. Let's let's try that. So glad to be of help, guys. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean that was just a general vibe of positivity about that from the actual writers on the forum. Indeed, yes. And there was a bit of talk about, uh, um, we were chatting about Ellie Goulding's Love Me Like You Do, and there were a few comments about, about that, which generally were more positive than, than the four of us were last time around. So <laughs> it's good to hear a different point of view. Very much so, yes. Thank you for chiming in there, guys. And uh, on which note, um, we'd love to hear some of your feedback about your favourite quirky artists. And also, have we have we nailed what quirky is or does it mean something different to you so do chime in on that either on twitter facebook or on the forum at some point over the next few weeks there brilliant so should we start signing off then guys um 
Thank you again for listening to our podcast. So we're going to do a round robin of our social network places. Firstly, regarding Songwriter Select itself. Um, if you are listening on iTunes, you can find us there. Please do spend a few moments to rate and review us on the podcast app. That is really important to spread the words because it helps um, other songwriters find this podcast and hopefully for them to enjoy it too. And if you're listening on YouTube, obviously do comment and share away there. Um, you can find us uh, on on Facebook at facebook.com slash songwriter select or on Twitter we are at SW Select Podcast. And individually you can find us on our social media. Becky, where can we find you? I am on SoundCloud as Becky Lucy Thomas. And I am on Twitter as Becky Lucy Music. Brilliant. Anthony, where can we find you? Uh well there's, uh, there's a couple of places. I would just want to plug the forum very quickly, songwriterforum.co.uk. Um, this is where we all uh, met and decided we want to do the podcast. If you're a songwriter, come along, check it out. And if you're interested in seeing what I'm up to, um, I'm only really updating my Facebook page at the moment. So go to facebook.com slash Anthony Lanism and you can see my weird rants. Brilliant. And Paul, where can we find you? Yeah, I lurk on the songwriterforum.co.uk as Boydie. Uh, the SoundCloud is Boydie Music, and I'm on Twitter as Boydie Music. Nice and straightforward. Equally, I am James Nighthawk, all one word, on pretty much everything you could think of, Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and so forth. And you can check out my music on Spotify, radio, all those streaming services, or on, even on the paid ones like iTunes and Amazon and such. Uh, that pretty much wraps us up for this week, guys. Um, thank you very much for joining me, as always, and um, good show, basically. Um, I think we got through that pretty well. Uh, we will see you all again in a few weeks, and until then, do make sure you contact us. Um, Becky, we've got the email address. Uh, uh, should I throw it in? Do you want to throw it in for us? Uh, you go for it. <laughs> okay, I've got it in front of me. You can also email us at songwriterselect at gmail.com for now. Brilliant. Thank you again, guys. That's all for this week. And we will see you again uh, probably early September. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.